All right, we're on record. My name is Tom Reynolds, and I am the president of the Reynolds Group, and uh, I will be your host for the next 45 minutes. So there you go. NextGen is a peer network. We founded it 20 years ago. Um, it's geared towards manufacturing, distribution, and technology companies, and our mission is to help business leaders adjust, leverage, and thrive. My background is manufacturing and software development, and I use that experience to do smarketing, which combines sales and marketing uh, to help people increase revenue. Um, I also have a business partner. She's not here yet, but her name is Hema Day, and she does SEO to sales, which is the same idea, but it's used digital marketing to increase uh, revenue. Um, we also have Linda Feinholz, who is a, um, a business growth strategist and coach. She's a great friend and she'll be helping me manage some of the questions. We also have Kenneth Dunn here, who's my communications director and uh, is brilliant at, at putting uh, words to paper and uh, helping people communicate better. Bruce introduced himself briefly, but Bruce uh, is our speaker next week. And if you're interesting, uh, interested in understanding why your customers do business with you and get a toolkit on how to leverage that so all your employees uh, are better at being rainmakers, you should show up next week. Um, so the speaker today is Heather, um, Heather uh, Antoine. She is a lawyer who focuses on digital marketing uh, or digital uh, uh, internet related law, excuse me, um, like cybercrime and privacy matters. And she'll be speaking today about privacy matters. Um, after her talk, I'm gonna post this video up on my blog, uh, which is www.reynoldsgroupweb.com. Um, okay, so we're trying something new this time, and that is that Heather's going to let um, uh, uh, Linda and I ask questions, and she's going to talk about digital privacy because um, uh, cause I want to try that interview style and Heather is a brave woman and she says, I'm ready to do it. So, uh, I'm going to start by asking a question and Heather, you can introduce yourself and then answer the question. So my big question is why do we need to understand California privacy laws and how is it really going to be a problem? What is the risk of not dealing with the privacy? Uh, issues in California and beyond. Take it away. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Heather Antoine. As Tom mentioned, I'm a partner at Stubbs Alderton and Markley's, and I am the um, co-chair of our privacy and data security uh, team. And um, I don't necessarily handle cybercrime, so I just want to make oh. sure we're not, <laughs> no one reaches out to me for any revenge porn issues. I mean, honestly, feel free to reach out and I'll get you into the right hands. It's just not my hands. Um, but what I do handle is, is privacy law and the, and the flow of data. And so why, why do we need to care? Um, we need to care because we've actually moved way past, you know, what used to be considered privacy law of your website, what you're just collecting on your website. All privacy laws for the most part now, it, especially the, the two big ones, which we'll talk about today, um, that most affect probably our clients and us are the GDPR and the CCPA. And those both um, apply whether it's information you're collecting online or it's information you just have collected. And so privacy law has really seeped its way into every single part of our life and all of the data that any company has could potentially be um, under regulation by various privacy laws. All right. Okay. Heather, this is Linda, Heather. So um, for our listeners, could you walk them through understanding, let's take them separately, GDPR. Let's sure. So the, and, and for everyone else on the call, I think I only see one is, are there any other, um, maybe two attorneys on the call, right? For, yeah. Okay. So for everyone else, I'm going to try to balance the, the level of detail I go into because I can sometimes go very into, into the woods here when I'm dealing with particularly privacy attorneys, but I'm going to dial it back. But if anyone has specific questions or if anyone wants me to be broader, fire away at me. I don't, we'll, maybe we'll do it a little bit like a firing squad. I'm, I'm totally open to it. It's a Friday afternoon. Let's, let's have some fun, right? Um, 
so the GDPR is the General Data Protection Regulation. It's EU's set of privacy regulations. Um, it was enacted in 2016 and actually went into effect in 2018. So they gave everyone in the EU about two years to comply. Um, and that was really the first privacy overhaul that shocked the system. Because prior to that, um, I've been practicing in, in privacy law for, you know, I guess almost almost a decade now. And when I was in law school, it didn't exist 15 years ago. Privacy law was not a thing. So it, it somewhat came around. And when I first started in it, no one even knew what it was. And it was one of those things where it was like, I would tell people, hey, you have to have a privacy policy on your website. And that was a shock to the system. Mm -hmm. So in 2018, when the GDPR took effect, and it was this massive set of regulations that governed everything about where data went, how it was collected, you had to tell people who it was shared with, who had access to it, you had to have data maps, this was really a really like revolutionary big deal and changed the way everything kind of um, the landscape of the privacy world. And so it's now been around for, for a couple of years and it's become the, the gold standard that many other privacy laws are modeled after. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, maybe we can <laughs> have that discussion if we have time, but, but that is the, the GDPR in a very small nutshell. So in practical terms, and I'll offer several different aspects, facets of this. So I run an Amazon business. I sell products on Amazon in the US. I don't, I don't ship them anywhere else. I'm a business consultant whose website is visible everywhere in the world. Um, I do online courses and so on. For folks in this huge range of involvement, the first magical words that people hear is in the EU and they say, so what's that got to do with me? Right. Yeah, so um, that is often the uh, misnomer and the, the other misnomer is people say, oh, well, it only applies to EU citizens. Mm -hmm. um, those are probably the two biggest myths. The, the GDPR applies to all businesses in the EU. That's prong number one. And then prong number two is anyone who is collecting the information of EU residents, not, not citizens. So let's say, Linda, you move to Europe, you move to Paris um, next month, and you're going to live there for a year. Congratulations. Sounds wonderful. I'm going to come visit. Um, you're now a, a resident of the EU, and you're protected under this law. So if you are an Amazon business that literally does not do any business in the EU, you do not sell there, you do not ship there, you do not try to reach out to them, um, then you don't have to comply with the GDPR. But if you're an international consultant and you have contacts in the EU, then you may have to comply depending on the, depending on the breadth of your contacts um, with the EU. And the, the difference with the GDPR and many other laws is the GDPR includes business contacts. So if you have a number of service providers in the EU, their business information, even if it's their business email address, their business address, that is all considered personal data under the GDPR. And so may be governed by those regulations as well. When you, uh, when you uh, explain things and things like GDPR, if you could always make sure you say what that means for our <clears throat> what those letters stand for first that's very helpful uh, if you don't yeah. and then dave watts has a question uh dave you want to you want to ask are you there uh, what is he still can you hear me now there you go now i can hear you okay great yeah i had an hey. audio problem earlier hi hi heather um so heather this is probably a little bit more for some of the other people too but when and why do you normally become engaged with a client um, so I, you know, as early as possible is when I like to become engaged with a client just because then I can see what the layout of the company is, but usually it's when there's some sort of change, right? Something has happened that either the CCPA took effect, which we'll get into the CCPA, that's the California Consumer Privacy Act. We'll get into that. So, you know, everyone heard that that, that was passed and was going to take effect. So 
a lot of people reached out um, or something else happens. Like the, the EU has, this may be a little bit into the woods, but in order to bring data from the EU into the US, you have to have a data transfer mechanism. And that mechanism is required because the EU inherently believes that the US does not protect data. The reason we don't protect data is not because of companies, but they believe that our government looks at all of our data, which they kind of do. So <laughs> as a result, you have to have a data transfer mechanism. Um, recently, one of those data mechanisms was blown up by the European Court of Justice. It was the privacy shield. It is now, it's now dead. And so when things like that, people often reach out to me again and say, hey, you know, what do we do now? Because all of a sudden, like the little ants in trail are spread around and they're trying to find their way. So usually when people start a company, they could reach out and then, or if they have some changes. And the, the other thing that comes up is in M&A transactions, and this is a piece that I always like to get people involved in as early as possible, because if you're setting up your company for sale down the line, when you get those M&A documents, the reps and warranties are going to have a representation in them that you are complying with all data protection laws. And unless you've done the back end work to comply with those laws, the second you have that rep in your hand, you don't have enough time to comply. It's impossible. So if you have a company that you are setting up for to position for sale at some point in the next, you know, whatever it is, year, you have to make sure those, all those, you know, everything's I's are dotted and T's are crossed. There we go. Yeah. And this is very much Thank about you. the collection, storage, handling, transfer, and use of people's data. Mm -hmm. So then along comes the CCPA and what is it adding on top of GDPR or running in parallel? Yeah, um, what is it adding? So the CCPA has an interesting history for, uh, and I'll, I just think it's fascinating, so I'll delve into it for a couple minutes here because it'll also play into the CPRA down the line. Um, the CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act, started because um, there was a real estate mogul who was having a conversation at a party with someone who worked at Google. The person at Google said, you know, oh, if you knew all the information we had on everyone, you would be shocked. And this real estate mogul decides he's going to take it up to be his, his mission in life to affect privacy change in, in California. So um, the last election in 2018, he placed the um, he placed a privacy law on that ballot, and it was it was bad. It was by all accounts it was bad. So the California legislature freaked out. All the privacy groups freaked out, and they basically gave him an you know a um, a carrot, and they said, hey, if you pull this off the ballot, we promise you we will get something into place by January first of the next year. And so they hurried up and drafted this privacy legislation, which now governs all California residents. It had typos in it. There were things that didn't make sense in it, but he did withdraw his proposition from the ballot as a result. And we now have the CCPA. From um, January of 2019 until January 1st of 2020, when it took effect, it went through an amendment process um, and it's still going through amendments, honestly. It had about 40 substantive amendments to make it more of a solidified, less contradictory law. But it was loosely modeled after the GDPR. So the rights that people get under these laws is if you're, un if you, are an EU citizen, you get about six rights. So you have the right to access, the right to deletion, the right to opt out of the sale of your information. Um, and all three of those rights were brought into the CCPA. And then EU citizens get some additional rights. They have the right to um, change their information. They have the, a, a right to deletion after um, death, things like that. So um, the right to be forgotten, we don't necessarily have those yet. Um, I know I was supposed to talk about the CPRA later, but I may as well just bring it up now. The CPRA, which is the California Privacy Rights Act, which is almost going to be CCPA 2.0, 
The same real estate mogul decided the CCPA did not go far enough. So he has placed that on the ballot in November. It is currently polling at about an 80% approval rate, which gives me chills. Um, and so we may have yet another California specific data privacy law to comply with. Um, the loose purpose of that law is to bring it closer to the GDPR so that the rights align more and the definitions of personal information align a little bit closer. Was his goal to stop Facebook and Google from accessing and using, quote, our data and information? Or was his intention blanket? Any government or private party? Yeah, I mean, the intent here is definitely to curb some of the behaviors of massive tech and social media companies. And I don't know if anyone's seen The Social Dilemma that was on, that's on Netflix right now. If you haven't, I actually recommend everyone watch it because it's, um, I think it's a really important documentary. And they, the information that's being collected on us that we don't even realize is being collected on us is massive. But the way that the US handles data is, you know, let's do it and get consent. So it's almost like a, there's, I think I've, I've had friends who are married often say like, no, no, I'll ask for forgiveness later, right? Mm -hmm. That's the way US handles data privacy. Whereas the EU, the difference is they're almost different. Like ask first and then you can do what you want. And I think that's the fundamental difference there that's almost problematic. But yes, it, it was geared toward these big companies, but looped in everyone because the CCPA applies to, am I talking too much? Oh, I'm supposed to talk, right? So it's okay. Um, <laughs> the CCPA applies to um, if you meet one of three triggers. So the first is 25 million and above in revenue. And that's kind of the catch all for the big companies. The second is if you receive 50% of your profit as a company from the sale of customer data. So that's intended to capture the data brokers and the ad networks as well. Um, and then the third, which affects most people, is that you collect the information of 50,000 or more consumers, households, or devices. And you can, when you think about those three things separately, as in I'm a consumer, this is my household and you know, I currently have two computers open, so that's two devices, and I have two iPhones, and that's two more devices. You can hit that 50,000 number really quickly. So um, the only good part about the CPRA is that it would increase that number to 100,000 if it passes, so that gives a little bit more wiggle room. But that's the catch-all that gets most of our, our companies. So. So Tom's got a question here, and I want to build on his question. Go for it, Tom. So, so if you were queen of the of the internet, what should I mean? There should be privacy laws. I mean, I, it's just crazy what's going on. What what would it what would it look like? Oh man, that would be my actually that would be my dream. Make me queen of the internet. <laughs> um, so, uh, one, I think we need a federal of comprehensive federal privacy law. We have federal privacy laws. People, when they talk about federal laws, forget that piece often, but it's very segmented. So, you know, health information is governed by HIPAA. Financial information is governed by Graham Leach Bliley, um, you know, so on and so forth. But we don't have a comprehensive federal law. And so as as a result, what's happened is states are creating their own laws. Maine, Nevada, California all have now privacy laws that you basically, if you do business in the US, you have to comply with because how do you exclude commerce from neighboring states, right? Or even any state in the US. It's just not the way things work anymore. Um, so a comprehensive federal law and one that more shifts to almost the EU way of looking at things, but not fully because there's problems there as well, but more of a get consent for what you want to do, particularly if it would surprise people what you want to do. And then, um, then have the, you can do what you want with the data. And some people are willing to sell their data. Some people don't care if you pay them, you know, whatever it is, $10 a month, 
they will let you track them everywhere in the world. But that would be shocking to a lot of people to realize how much they're being tracked. So here's a practical two-sided question. Bottom of every website we go to now, there's a little hyperlink that says privacy or privacy policy. And you click and you open and you read. And none of us do. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that I may be grossly exaggerating. 95% of websites where it says privacy policy and there's words behind it, one human being spent five minutes going, yeah, 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 fine, just get it up. They don't know what it says. Yeah. And they literally don't know on a practical level what is a company supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's... That that's where an attorney comes in, frankly. I, I, had, um, I had a client come to us, I think it was last year, and I was looking at their privacy policy on their website. They wanted me to, to edit it. And I said, okay, it looks here like you've registered for Privacy Shield. And they said, oh, no, what's that? And I said, well, where did you get the policy from? We, co we copied it from some other similar companies that we thought did what we do. And the problem with that is the company may do what you do, but the practices that they have are not your practices. And so you end up with a privacy policy that doesn't match your data practices. And that's where you get in trouble. That's where the attorney general looks at what you're doing and, and has an issue. So, um, you know, either have someone on the team who's really good at figuring out what the data practices are and can write a policy or, or reach out to, reach out to a privacy attorney. So Jim Tortle asked a question, which is, uh, is the CCPA just another excuse for low life tort lawyers, I'm just you know, saying what he said, to take advantage of already stressed smaller companies? Um, I, won't, I won't use that terminology, but I will <laughs> say, luckily, no. As part of the amendment process, the um, plaintiffs, um, lobbied, plaintiffs groups lobbied a lot to have a personal right of action to a breach of the CCPA. That was not included in the final version. So the only one who can enforce the CCPA is the Attorney General of California. They've created a, a small department. Um, if the CPRA passes, there's going to be an entire department. So that'll cost the state of California um, a right. fair amount of decree. But <laughs> but the CCPA can only be enforced by the Attorney General with one caveat. If there is a data breach, there is a private right of action um, as a result of the data breach. And the, the, the penalty there is, is pretty substantial. It's $250 per violation for non-intentional and $750 for intentional violations. Wow. Thomas, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself because you've got a question you want to pose. So um, if you're a smaller company or if you're a company based elsewhere but doing business in the U.S. Uh, and you don't, have, you don't have the information on your own servers, what level of protection, if any, is there from relying on an outside vendor and their privacy policy? So if you're based... You're based out of, if you're a small company based out of the U.S., it's going to depend on, on where you're based. So California doesn't have a data transfer mechanism requirement in its law. The EU does. So if you're based in the EU and you're collecting EU data, you're okay. If you're mm -hmm. based in California and you're collecting EU data and storing it on servers, you know, maybe here in the U.S., um, most of the storage service providers, so like AWS obviously would be, Amazon Web Services would be the biggest of the big as they are, or Google. They already have standard contractual clauses in place that allow for that transfer of data and you know all of the security that you could hope for. Nothing is 100% secure, but, but at least that mechanism is in place. What you actually don't want to end up with is someone who has is storing their own data because that's almost more risky than than using a, a larger. I turned that off. I'm so sorry. Um, did that answer the question or? Yes. Yes, it did. Okay. Jeff, you have a question. Why don't you go ahead and and uh, unmute and talk away? Yeah. Hello, Heather. Hi, um, 
So the regulations that are put in place by different entities, do, do they conflict with one another so that you've got just weird regulations or are they pretty much in alignment with um, the regulations? Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. And, and in most ways, they do not conflict. They overlap in, in, and create this patchwork that's almost impossible to navigate, frankly. I mean, I'm, I'm tracking privacy laws that are pending in other jurisdictions and other laws constantly. Um, Brazil enacted a privacy law that took effect today. So, and if you have clients that have customers in Brazil, as of today, you have to comply with their version of the GDPR. So they mostly meld together with these little tangents with a couple of, of conflicting issues. So the definition of data breach under our data privacy laws is different than the definition of data breach under the CCPA. And there's weird things that don't match up. So as I mentioned, there's a private right of action um, for plaintiff's lawyers to sue a class action claim um, for under the CCPA. But data breach notification aren't, doesn't have the same definition of personal information as the CCPA. So you may not ever find out that a data breach occurred in order to even bring the lawsuit. There's just these little weird connected loopholes that don't don't all connect, honestly. Thank you. Thomas, you've got a follow-up question. And then after that, we're going to go to Dave. Yeah, so uh, I have a specific company in mind who are in the process of expanding into the U.S. And I had a question about the CCP triggers. You said 25 million or more in revenue collecting information from 50,000 households or more. And I, for I forget the last one, but... The company doesn't do business with individuals. Uh, they do have more than $25 million in revenue in e the EU. They're a European company. They don't in the US yet, but probably will fairly soon. What are, um, is the, first of all, is the 25 million in the EU sufficient to trigger the CCPA? And what, what else should they consider expanding into the US? Yeah, it's, so it, it's global revenue, but if they don't have any, so, um, you know, I mentioned the GDPR includes business contacts. Currently, if, you, if you're only dealing with service providers in California, there's a moratorium for that. But if you do have business contacts that have personal information, they may have to comply. And the 25 million is global. So that's one where I would, I would actually want to talk to them just to figure out. It's almost like a borderline thing. They may, they may not um, have to comply with the CCPA. Dave, do you have a question you'd like to ask? I do. This is kind of a follow-up on what Heather said about AWS. I um, want to clarify something. So if a company has their servers hosted at AWS or Azure, um, um, wouldn't AWS's privacy poly policy, excuse me, only apply to whatever data they have access to, uh, the company would still be responsible, correct, for any data that they're putting on their own servers that are hosted there. Does that make sense? Yes, 100%. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah, sort of clarify that because I think that's a big, that's an important distinction. A lot of times people think, oh, I've got an AWS or Azure, I'm good to go. And that's not right. the case. No, you're still responsible for all of your data. The only, the benefit of having it in something like AWS or Azure is that there's that mechanism that allows the data to flow and that there's, you know, that security protection. Yeah, so... Okay. But can I comment on that real quick? One thing I often, yeah, on the security yeah. bar, you know, <laughs> love to talk about security. Um, a common misconception though is that, oh, I have it at AWS, my security is great. Um, it's mm -hmm. completely configurable by the client though. So mm -hmm. um, it's very important that they still go through whatever cybersecurity requirements are in fact required by CCPA or anything else that applies to them. Yeah. Thanks. Jim, you've got a topic you'd like to raise. Jim Twerdall. Um, you know, in the United States, the anti-spam and anti-robocall laws are just not enforced. 
Do you think this will end up being the same way that we'll have laws on the books that will only be used selectively against big companies when politics come and in, intervene? No, I, I don't. But I do think what I think is going to happen is we're going to hit a breaking point with these laws where it will just be too many state laws because most small companies can't afford what it takes to comply with every single one of these laws that's out there right now. So you kind of do like a, a sweeping like, all right, well, we'll tackle Canada and the US and we'll deal with Europe later. One of those, right? So um, I, I think there's going to have to be some sort of change in the way these laws are, are formatted, but I think they're going to be enforced. I really do. Heather, it's, you're, you're, bringing, as possible. you're bringing up a really important issue. I'll go back to the Amazon uh, uh, example. Uh, you know, for a seller on Amazon, depending on the state you live in, you do or don't have to pay all kinds of tiers of taxes of product, your products sold in your state. If you never register with any of the other states where your products are sold, you can kind of sit behind the curtain and pretend you don't know about their state laws because mm -hmm. they don't have the bandwidth to come after each and every seller on Amazon. Now what Amazon has done in the last 12 months is they've basically declared to all sellers forget the way you want to do it. We're collecting state taxes everywhere and we're submitting them. So every purchase somebody makes of you, we're submitting to the municipal, the county, state, whatever of every single place your products are sold. In some states it's um, your tax when you sell there and some places you're taxed if someone bought there. Two completely different things. So I think about the privacy policy in the same way that I can see a lot of people saying, I don't care if my, my, I do business electronically with all 50 states, I'll worry about what California has to say and just, dear God, deliberately choose to be blind to the fact that other states have state laws. Yeah, the, I think if you pick the most comprehensive law, you're probably almost safe. So, you know, I had a, I had a client this morning that called, they are, they're a European company. They are compliant with the GDPR. They just want to become compliant with the CCPA. So if you're compliant with the GDPR, which is probably the most comprehensive law, you've got a 20% hangover that you have to cure for, right? Um, if you're compliant with the CCPA, you're likely compliant right now with Nevada's law for the most part. You can just put in a little blurb. So there's, you know, the, what is it when we were in school with the math, the least common denominator, the greatest common, pick the greatest common denominator and then kind of account for it. Um, but, you know, I guess this goes back to Jim's point. Can, can they all be enforced? No, there's, there's no entity on earth that can look at everyone's company and, and dig into it. Not only to say, is their privacy policy up? which would be step number one. But to know whether it's accurate or not, you actually have to know the company. And so it's that extra piece that just makes it, makes it a little difficult. I guess, yeah, but we can't get to everyone, but at least they're, they're probably enforcing it to a certain extent. So anyone who has subscribed to a company's newsletter, anybody who has sent an email inquiry to a department and, you know, most email servers capture inbound emails and stick them in storage and so on. So the person whose data is now inside a company's system, at the moment, what are they allowed to do? Write someone, but who knows who, to say, take me out of your email system. What, what is it that the, the originator of the data yeah. is supposedly able to do or inquire about? Yeah, so what I would actually suggest for, for everyone on this call, if you haven't already done it, is exercise your rights under the CPA to the, to the big clients that have your data. And you'll be, it, it'll be a good pr process. So go to Google at the, you know, go to their privacy policy or go to Amazon, Spotify, Facebook, whoever it may be, go to their privacy policy and then request access to your information. And that's a right you have under the CCPA. They will then give you a file that's full of everything they've collected on you. 
Um, you can also, if you no longer want to use these services, you can request that you delete your information and they'll do that for you. And then a lot of companies you'll see have a link It'll say terms of use, privacy policy, and then there will be a third link for do not sell my personal information. And that's one people can absolutely utilize because that'll, inc that'll include um, sale loosely here, which includes like ad retargeting, theoretically ad networks. And if you click on that and ask the company not to sell that information, then that takes you out of a little bit more. You can always unsubscribe. That's kind of an annotated law now. So there's a partnership here between the legal side and the operation side. Do most companies who have stuck that privacy policy language on their website actually have a human being who manages those three requests? Either a human being or a vendor. I, I, I don't know about most. I know about my, most of my clients, I will say, either have a human being who's monitoring you know, these requests because you have to comply with the, within a certain amount of time, 45 days or else, you know, you're in violation. Mm -hmm. um, or there is a number of vendors out there who will, who will make this all a simple process for a company for a price mm -hmm. and you pay them and they track everything and, and they'll tell you, you know, so-and-so has requested the information um, and you now have 45 days, they track the consents, they track everything. If anyone's interested in, in names of some of those companies, it's like, um, One Trust, Trust Arc, um, there's a number of companies out there, Wirewheel, that all do this sort of data consent management and CCPA and GDPR assistance. I suspect, and Tom, you can probably confirm this, that most of the companies we know as our clients are going to need the outsource because the hierarchy of responsibility of having an employee who's responsible of getting it done right and having the systems done right, you're getting someone off their core business. Right. So I have a question, and I we're pushing up to my 45 minute limit. So just so, um, first of all, can people raise their hand if they can, because some of you have turned off your things, of who actually collects emails from clients? If you ever collect email from clients, okay. I, I think that's most of us, right? So I, I'm collecting emails for doing these things. I mean, I'll only tell you, I don't make money running these things, but I, my, my opportunity is collecting emails from my newsletter, right? And hopefully people might want some marketing services. Can you give me three takeaways that I need to think about, about collecting data like this that we should all be thinking about? Yes, my my takeaways would be um, one think think beyond the internet. Think beyond about what what you're collecting through your website. Because as I started with um, privacy law, is so much more expansive than that now. It's really what is the data that's coming in into the company, right? So think that expansively there. Um, think globally because you always want to make sure you figure out where you or your company's data is flowing. Where is it going? You know, are we collecting data from Brazil? Are we collecting data from Canada? And so then that way you can really have a, a sense of um, what you need to comply with. And, you know, I guess my third takeaway, which may be a little selfish and maybe I'm not supposed to say, which is no, consider voting no on the on prop 24 because so many of our, our companies and so many clients I've worked with are just now finally getting up to speed with the CCPA and even though it needs amendments and it absolutely does need help I don't think this is the proper way to fix it and I think it's making it so that a lot of small to medium-sized businesses are are spending you know thousands and thousands of dollars trying to comply with with just layered laws, um, and I don't think it's the right way to do it. But Heather, are you the starting point for a company? Would they engage you to identify any and all data security and privacy laws that apply to them? Are you the starting point for that, or these outsourced companies? No, I'm. I'm generally the starting point, and we have an, You know, we would have an intake. We talk about what applies. Um, and then I work with the companies to actually get compliance. So, you know, step one, if you want, engage a vendor. 
if you want, if you guys have a big software development team and you can build this stuff out yourself, awesome. I've had clients do that. No, just tell us what you want us to build. We'll build it. Great. Um, so, you know, it just depends, but, but figure out what's needed and then build from there and, and bring in the vendors or whatever else is needed down the line. Great. Thank you. So, uh, Dave, it looks like you have one more question that maybe didn't get answered. Do you want to ask? Actually, Linda, Linda just asked it for me, so I okay. appreciate it. Okay, great. All right. And if anyone has questions that I didn't answer, um, feel free to reach out to me or any questions that pop up later, let me know. I know it's Friday, so I'm here. Happy to talk. Yeah, and you're welcome to reach out to me, and I'll put uh, her uh, link to her LinkedIn, which is another way to contact her uh, up on the blog. It's also in the email. Um, so I'm going to, you know, try to, to stay true, true to my 45 minute thing here. So you were fabulous. Thank you so much for your time. You kept it at a level that we all could understand, which is nice. And you gave us some good takeaway, which is always my mission. So, um, and hopefully the people who weren't on screen got some lunch in too. So I'm glad we could enjoy lunch. So thank you all. Come next week and hear Bruce. I think you lawyers in particular would benefit from listening to Bruce because he's a great at helping your whole team become rainmakers. So uh, making you think through that whole thing. So uh, the whole recording will be up on my blog by the end of the day and you can watch this again if you'd like. So thank you, Heather. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Heather. It was great. Thank you, Heather. Heather. All right. Bye.